Hi Booktube and welcome to a new video uh, in which I want to talk about psychogeography in literature um, which is a very big thing in the UK and has been for quite a few years from uh, big writers like Will Self and Ian Sinclair to people writing about uh, pub carpets. Um, <clears throat> it's not just in non-fiction um, it's also in fiction when you get a writer like Benjamin Myers who writes in sort of folklore mythology around place uh, which has become huge you know he's a really big writer in the UK um, now I have to say I do not I have no interest in psychogeography at all uh, and the only reason I'm talking to you about it is because a mixture of non-fiction no member and um, Eric Carl Anderson recommending uh, the book I'm going to talk about uh, on his channel which is this called Car Park Life uh, and before uh, I sort of talk about why um, I have no interest in psychogeography, I will just say that uh, this appeal, you know, hearing Eric talking about this, this appealed to me because uh, I have a real thing about sort of knife crime, youth knife crime in, in Britain. Uh, and I watch any programme, any documentary going on it. And gradually a picture builds up uh, that um, not only a sort of drill videos, which are music videos made where one gang calls out and insults another, and, you know, in song, in rap, and put, play, post it to YouTube, and that some of these videos are recorded in car parks, uh, but also that uh, the, the, um, the attacks that come back the other way, uh, someone was actually stabbed, you know, one of the, the video, one of the the singers in one of these videos was stabbed to death in a car park so car parks do have a space in my psyche um the other reason is as i you know read uh, early on in this book i realized that a lot of the uh, sounds uh in the car park uh, apart from the sound of cars and people uh a lot of the sound of the wind for example uh the descriptions of the the detritus that gets found on the edges of these car parks you know around the perimeter mesh fences or stuck in the foliage that pops that is poking through the, through these fences that's exactly the experience i have in my uh little uh sort of car park i don't drive i have to catch a bus uh to go to my grocery store but where my grocery store is it is a small it's part of a small mile and there is a car park there and the descriptions here absolutely I recognised uh, in my weekly sojourn to, to my own uh, car park uh, at a mile. So those are the two sort of things I think that when Eric was talking about this book it resonated with me. But to go back to why I don't get on with psychic geography. Well first of all psychic geography to me is a tautology because all geography is a creation of the human psyche. Uh, you know, even a mountain, which most people w w would say has objective reality, uh, it does, it exists, it has a materiality and a tangibility, but what it, you know, anything else that accrues to that mountain, such as mythology, gods who reside there, or the challenge that it presents in order to be scaled by mountaineers, or, you know, it's geographical processes like glaciation or, or whatever. These are all only in existence because mankind has come up with these conceptions. So the mountain exists, but anything else accrued to it is uh, an outcrop of psychic you know, activity on our heart. So to me, psychogeography is a tautology. Um, now, it's true uh, in a voice that if all sort of subjects of knowledge uh, are human creations, um, you know, history, um, biology, uh, yes, biology has a again like the mountain has a tangible reality, but the laws of biology and the things we find out about you know cell reproduction and all of that it takes a human agency to unravel these things. Uh, if there was no human kind, these processes would still go on in rats and monkeys and cheetahs, but no one would know about them. Um, the only possible exception is mass because if if one buys into the notion that the whole of the universe is structured according to mathematical equations and that harmonies and symmetries and all of that again it would still take human agency to uncover that in the same way as any of the other sort of bodies of knowledge but it does have an existence you know those those mathematical laws do exist whether they're uncovered or not i'm not sure i buy that 
But anyway, so the first thing is to me, the notion of psychogeography is a tautology. But more importantly, why I'm not interested in this subject is any time that um, geography um, becomes mythologized. So, you know, what, what Will Self and Ian Sinclair and others do is they, um, they, they sort of walk around neglected areas, non-places. So in uh, Will Self's uh, case, he went on a series of walks when he flew into a new uh, city, new, sorry, when he flew into a different city, instead of getting a cab from the airport, he'd walk from the airport to his hotel in places like Los Angeles. Like no, no one of sane mind would do that. But Self did it in order to observe what everyone else neglects. Uh, with Ian Sinclair, he did a, a similar thing, walking around the ring road uh, out, out, that goes around London. Uh, and another perhaps more pertinent book that Sinclair did is that he walked around the parts of East London that uh, were all boarded up because they were purchased under compulsory purchase orders in order to be demolished for the building of the, the Olympic Stadium and, and other sort of Olympic venues, the 2012 London Olympics. So he was trying to preserve the, you know, the sort of quixotic and random sort of development of these places that were about to be levelled for this, you know, for the Olympic Stadium. So there's nothing, you know, I, this notion of a, a non-place or a place in between, a liminal place or a neglected place or a place of transit that you just pass through has no inherent value in itself. I have no problem with exploring these places. Uh, you know, I, I myself, I have an aesthetic of decay. I like sort of observing ruin and decay from an aesthetic point of view. Um, the problem I have is when it starts getting mythologised, when all these imaginary or creative stories are lumped on these places to try and elevate them into something they're not. Um, and um, I would say it's called Car Park Life by Gareth Rees. Uh, so to give an example or an attempted justification of that. So this is towards the end of the book. This is when uh, Rees, in a way, tries to justify the whole, the whole thing of his endeavour, but I think wider justification of psychogeography itself. But for me, the joy of landscape is more than the location itself. It is about a state of mind in which you see the magic, weirdness and terror that runs through every particle, every atom of the universe. It isn't only there in the spooky forest and the abandoned fairgrounds, the canal and the summer meadow. It's in the mundane, everyday places where people work, play and live, even on those monopolised by corporations and an interest only in profiting from you. So I don't buy that. I really don't buy that. As I say, I have no problem in exploring these spaces, these places to see what human agency, you know, does. You know, it's hard to sort of track back to why these places were built in the first place and the way that they've been built and then left to neglect, particularly where sort of industrial patterns have changed, moved on or things have been abandoned. It's quite hard to recreate that. But it's not hard to recreate where people, you know, repurpose these spaces and flock to them. So in the case of car parks here, it's very much, you know, some of the spaces become, you know, racing tracks of boy racers at night. You know, drug deals are done there. Homeless people sleep there. Um, all, all sorts of things. Now, I think it's absolutely legitimate to explore that, to report on that. But to try and elevate it into something more mythical and magical, I absolutely reject 100%. And another thing that this book does it, is it tries to become a critique of consumerism. Absolutely legitimate, um, but problematic. Because, first of all, he sets himself uh, a restriction whereby he's only interested in the car park. He's not interested in the shop. He has these rules. He will not go into the shops. He will not buy anything from the shops. He will not drive into the car park. He will only walk into it to preserve the purity of the experience that he wants. And yet, a lot of this book is taken up with describing the architecture of the shops, of how consumerism meets uh, the history of the place, meets environmentalism or, or destroys environmentalism, tries to present it, you know, tries to sort of preserve history or, or erase history by being sort of glass and steel, you know, complete new builds and all this sort of stuff. So somewhere between the journey between the car park and the sliding doors of the mall, he is sucked in into his, 
his sort of you know critique of consumerism it's not po it doesn't seem possible to me to be to make a critique of consumerism stood out in the car park alone you still have to enter the shots which he said he's not going to do and you know it's quite interesting that you know the boy racers that one of the things they you know when he does talk to them they complain about the expense of having a proper racetrack which does exist sort of you know further further away but it's too expensive and so his critique of consumerism the one thing it neglects to mention is the class aspect of this you know who who shops at malls well his his argument is everyone does and that's that's why people can camouflage themselves in in sort of the everyday mundanity of it in order to do things like you know drug deals there's a you know assassination of um, a, a paramilitary in Northern Ireland happens in a in a car park in a retail um, shop area. There's a Scottish um, gangster who's murdered by a rival gangster. In you know and these are like interesting reportage, but I think he's wrong to miss out the element of class. I don't think everyone does go to these malls. You know, the people who shop in Regent Street and Bond Street in London, the really rich, the Russian oligarchs, uh, the Saudi princes, admittedly a very, very tiny, small percentage, but they're not going to malls in, you know, that are portrayed in this book. There is a huge class element and a class critique of consumerism that is, that is neglected here because he sort of presents it as all life is to be found at the mall. It isn't. And a lot of the people, again, you know, this notion of sort of class analysis that's missing, you know, people who, you know, teenagers who go hang out at these, you know, empty car parks at night to smoke spliff, to make out with their girlfriends, to drink alcohol, uh, to be boy racers, they're doing it because they don't have access to private space, you know, a home of their own, as it were. That, again, is a class-based analysis I would make that is not in here. Um, also, another problem is, in a way, he's been gazumped because the, the you know the king of all car park stories is the fact that the remains of of a British king, King Richard, was found buried underneath a car park in Leicester, um, and it's kind of hard to you know to tr to trump that really. He's got the you know Greece goes the other way and talking about the banality of of, of, of lots of things. But even there, again, this comes back to this mythologizing. Reese offers up here, you know, the letter R was painted directly on the tarmac beneath which these bones um, were lying. And he speculates, is that R for Richard? Is it R for Rex, the Latin for King? Uh, or is it R for reserved parking? The point is, we don't know. The point it is irrelevant because this is not some sort of psycho geomancy that some some you know past creature was able to commune with whoever painted the letter R on that car park space. It doesn't hold up. It it just it's too much mythologizing, and that and that's the problem I have it I have with with it really. Um, and some more examples of this of this mythologizing. So uh, one of the towns uh, has sort of got a, a long a long ago developed history where a, a you know a beaker uh the beaker folk who crossed from sort of continental switzerland and were very gifted in jewelry and metal working uh, this is in sort of you know prehistoric times um came to england and brought brought some of their skills and we know this because of some of the artifacts that were found in the area so in order to commune with that the count, the city council, has erected a, a sort of a statue of this beaker folk, beaker sort of ancestor, and it sits in the car park of um, of of the retail park. And Rees comments, "This is the ancestor, a seven-ton steel statue erected at Stonehenge in 2010, then moved here to become guardian of the park." This man, a metallurgical genius who came from Europe to usher in the Bronze Age, a craftsman who fell to his knees at the sight of the solstice sun glaring through the blue stones. He is an attempt to connect this community of 21st century fast food franchises with the ancient people, to make a link between sun worship and the golden arches, to somehow replace what is lost in the landscape, the forgotten secrets, the buried mysteries, the missing knowledge, the wrong turnings for humankind since he once kneeled here and praised the light. 
Well, no, it isn't. That's mythological nonsense. What it is, is a city council trying to sort of brand their city to make it appealing to tourists and to increase trade and commerce within its own residents. It's complete nonsense. It's a very cynical act, sort of plundering one's own heritage, commodifying, commercialising one's own heritage in order to spark future profits. It's nothing to do with this communing between the ancient past and, and, and now. And another one where he asks the question, he finds these strange um, sort of markings on columns holding up another um, another retail park. That's what it looks like. And he's wondering about them. He goes, but is it accident or art? Are these the song lines of Sainsbury's, which is a supermarket? No, they're not. I don't know what caused them, but they're not, they're not something mythical linked to Aboriginal song lines. And then he goes on to talk about uh, the sort of radical artist Brian Geisen, who was a collaborator of William Burroughs in the 60s and 70s, who used similar sort of techniques of these markings to develop what he called a dream machine. A bit like one of those babies' sort of night lights where there are little cutouts on the lampshade uh, in shapes of bears and, and stars and all that sort of thing. So uh, as the light turns round, uh, um, the projection of these on the ceiling, that's a bit like sort of Geisen's, uh, Geisen's uh, dream machine. So he's making a link between the technique and the effect of, of Geisen, sorry, Brian Geisen's uh, dream machine to, to this, you know, this pattern. Now, that is so subjective. I don't believe there's anyone else standing in a car park, in a retail park in the UK, or even, a, you know, anywhere in the world, who's having that exact same thought about a set of markings and comparing it back to Brian Geisen. And this is, again, you know, it's a mythologising, but the weird thing is, it's a very, very subjective, personal, individualised mythologising. And that's where you realise that so much of psychogeography is not only bullshit, but it's actually memoir. This book really is, falls between being psychogeography and memoir. You know, his marriage breaks up during the course of, of all his research for this. And, you know, it comes as a bolt from the blue to him, you know, or at least he reports it does. And yet, from how he talks about it in the book, the number of times he's abandoned them to the car to, you know, look at their phones while he nips off to ex explore the local car park, it's hardly surprising. And yet that's unfair, because he's only talked about his failing marriage in the terms of, around the research he was doing for this. So he's put it in the book, but we can't judge him because we don't have all the information. Um, you know, he in the book, he's physically present with his family, but he's absent, really, because his, his mind is on his, his quest for car parks. So it doesn't even work as a memoir, even as a snapshot of that time in his life, because it's partial. That's what I mean, it falls between the two stalls of psychic geography, psychogeography and memoir. It's neither one nor the other. Um, and some other examples of the strange world inhabited by this book. So again, this, <laughs> this is where it sort of um, veers over into me memoir. Um, I don't know why, but I feel suddenly bored of it all. Tapping notes into my Samsung, a woman staring at me from behind the window with her mug of tea and cheese toasty. I'm bored of the architecture of consumerism, bored of supermarket car parks, bored of myself going on about it. I might even be wrong, too, in my assertion that they're inherently idiosyncratic. Maybe it's just my imagination, and they really are all the same. After all, what's going to happen next day, next today in this Morrison's car park? I expect I'll walk around and take photos of security cameras, wonky bollards and randomly placed shopping trolleys. Perhaps an amusingly random piece of litter in the shrub. Maybe a red ball can or a child's sock or a condom. I'll observe someone being odd, either in their car or going to their car, or hanging around the perimeter. Then that will be that. Dear God, sometimes I wonder if I've taken a wrong turning in life. I'm not really sure why I'm in Caerphilly, looking around a superstore instead of wandering around the magnificent 13th century castle, or simply getting into my car and driving home to Hastings. Yeah, exactly. 
So if he's having self-doubts, where does that leave the reader? You know, he's given us the option of thinking this is all a complete waste of time. And unfortunately, I take that option. And I did read to the end. But, you know, if he's having doubts, and again, that's not about psychogeography. He's sort of saying at, this, at that particular point in his life, psychogeography was waning and he's questioning his whole life. So, again, it's not really about psychogeography. It's about him. And do you get the idea? You know, psychogeography is trying to sort of append some sort of universally accepted or consensual story or mythology to places that otherwise don't advertise themselves as having such stories. But actually, because it keeps coming back to the I, the Gareth Rees, the memoir aspect of it, you realise it's completely arbitrary, completely subjective, pertinent to him and him only. And I feel excluded, even if I wanted to invest these places with, with significance and meaning like he does. I can't. I'm shut out of it. Even though, as I say, in my local supermarket, I recognise in the car park, I recognise the sounds, I recognise the sights, I recognise the strewn rubbish. Absolutely, that is universal. I mean, not exactly the same, but, but you know, enough of recognition. But I see no need to elevate it. Uh, above and beyond anything than than that, and I think you know where he has observed, where he is an observing eye, and reporting rather than imbuing and building and mythologizing and offering interpretation on top. Where it is just simple reportage, I really liked it. So I like the stuff about you know those boy racers. I like the stuff about you know the gang leader and the paramilitary who were killed in car parks because they're just straight reportage, and I didn't know about them. But when he starts of embellishing them and trying to interpret them and make them grandiose, they're not. And, you know, when he talked in, you know, in the, in the terms of the sort of the cosmic significance from that last section, from the section I read out as the justification for all psychogeography, so that somehow the humble car park is on the same comparative level with the atoms and everything that make up the cosmos. So finally, this is very early on in the book. Car parks are an intricate, sorry, car parks are an intrinsic part of the landscape, like them or not. And if they are going to encroach on the space where our common grounds, marketplaces, municipal buildings, factories and marshlands once were, then we have a right to interrogate the space, find a way to embrace it, even learn from it. What do we even know about these places? Are they simply slabs of tarmac or are they something more? Do they have the potential to contribute something of worth to society? Or are they pernicious entities, Trojan horses of neoliberalism ruining us from the inside, sites of psychosis, decay and disaster? Someone needs to find out. Well, yes and no, really. Um, they are sites of decay and there probably is a science of, of how any particular site got into that state of decay that you could possibly plot. But does it tell us anything more? Does it lead us to any hard and fast scientific rules, or in this case rules about social development and movement? You know, he sort of says, neoliberalism ruining us from the inside. No, car parks are not. They're, they're symptomatic and they're symbolic of neoliberalism and consumerism, but car parks themselves are not ruining us from the inside. Uh, yes, there's a much wider argument about cars, the pernicious nature of cars that everyone expects to... The, uh, own a car as a human right and cars are destroying the environment cars are making us sort of plan cities so that you know there's car spot car parking space available yes there is that but the car park itself is one tiny part of the car it is not in and of itself really worth devoting a whole book to as some sort of critique of britain or some sort of critique of capitalism or consumerism it can't bear the weight and ultimately as i say i like the reportage bits anything embellished on top i rejected out of hand so this was car park life by gareth uh reese uh you know even the blurb here from uh an author called john green grindred grindrod a retail park heart of darkness well no <laughs> okay Thanks a lot. And finally, in Nonfiction November, we have this. Now, this doesn't form part of the formal Nonfiction uh, November uh, challenge because 
the only prompt I've got left uh, is sport and I do have a book for that but I don't get hold of that book until December when my son's back from university. Um, so this is absolutely coincidental that I read this uh, during non-fiction November and it's absolutely coincidental because I didn't realise it was non-fiction. Dave Eggers, a writer whose novels I tend to read at least one a year, he's very, very prolific. Indeed, I've got two more of his uh, lined up. I thought I had three, but as I say, this turns out it's non-fiction. So that was a surprise to me. Uh, and it was complete serendipity that I was reading it in November. So it is the story of uh, a Yemeni American uh, who's not exactly a chancer, but he's completely sort of unprepared for the, the challenge he sets himself. And it's a mixture of charisma and a bit of sort of... Uh, a uh, gift of the gab that manages to talk himself out of difficult situations because he discovers that Yemen was the original site of cultivation of the coffee bean, which I didn't know, and that Yemen and Ethiopia, which is sort of uh, either side of each other divided by the Red Sea, is really where coffee cultivation and processing started, uh, I think about 700 years ago. And this guy decides that he's going to... That Yemen's sort of reputation in the coffee world has dropped off the table. And he's decided that he's going to sort of reinvigorate it and make Yemeni coffee great again uh, in the 2000s because every, the whole world's gone mad for coffee and you have all these sort of specialty coffees that cost, you know, 15 bucks a, a cup. And that's the market he wants to get into. And, you know... He's basically, he's had lots of jobs, including selling uh, cars, being the doorman of a luxury apartment block. So he doesn't really have any background in this. But as I say, he sort of manages to sort of muddle his way through. Uh, that, that basically is, is the, the, you know, the, what this story is. And of course, Yemen is in the middle of a civil war. So I should have said that. Um, that he's trying to do all of this in the middle of the Yemeni civil war. So we get 120 pages of like the history of coffee and also his sort of upbringing in the Tenderloin in San Francisco, uh, which is a drag, to be honest, that first 120 pages. The only interesting thing I learned about it, because I don't drink coffee. I'm not interested in coffee. I actually think it's a strike against mankind in the West that, you know, we have $18 uh, coffee, but somehow this has become... Uh, a sort of a luxury item, but luxury everyday item. I can't remember which one of my books it is. In fact, I think it's in my current work in process. I'm actually talking about coffee in terms of actually we, on the whole, tend to use it to reclaim sort of the hours that we've invested in sort of, you know, being on a binge on the night before and we use coffee to revive ourselves so we can, you know, do our, our work. So I'm pretty hostile to the whole concept of coffee as it's become in the early 21st century. So I'm not interested in it. But the one thing I was interested in was, you know, it was basically colonial powers smuggled coffee out of Yemen and Ethiopia and spread, you know, like the Dutch spread it to Java in Indonesia, which is a Dutch colony. It ended up in the Caribbean. It ended up in Brazil because it's very similar to how silk was smuggled out of China. You know, there were these sort of agents of colonial powers who basically stole it and, and you know, planted it in, you know, in, within the empire where, where these, these, these products would flourish. So, you know, out of 120 pages, that was the only nugget I gleaned. And then we move into him trying to do his thing in Yemen in the middle of the civil war and the, the, the bits about the civil war are interesting it gave me a bit more insight into exactly which party is which between Iran Saudi Arabia the Houthis within Yemen etc etc but the actual detail of the, of the of the obstacles he had to overcome and the sort of the scary moments and the mad bureaucratic moments and all this sort of thing. I'd read very similar in a novel called Death is Hard Work, which is set during the Syrian Civil War. So actually, this didn't read as particularly new or, or different from that, because in, in sort of modern, you know, sort of civil wars within slightly underdeveloped countries... Um, people seem to act the same um so i didn't get a lot out of this book really and it made me it made you know i don't read biographies the number of biographies i've ever read i can count on the fingers of one hand 
two or three of them have been Burroughs, um, uh, Kafka, and Ian Curtis of Joy Division, who are all artists. And as much as I admire their work, I'm not sure how interesting biographies are because biographies find it very hard, as do any of us, to pin down where does creativity come from. You can say what events or ideas influence artists in their work, but where does creativity come, you know, itself? And I read a book by Anthony Storr called Creativity, and that didn't enlighten me any further. So I have read biographies about creative people, but I'm not quite sure why. I think I was probably just interested in aspects of their lives rather than trying to ask, answer the question, where does creativity come from? But biographies of, you know, I, I've never read biographies of famous people, of historical figures or... You know, I can understand the, the need to write a biography of someone who's dead because obviously they can they can no more comment on their life now that they're dead. So I can understand that going back and recreating a life that is no longer here. I absolutely get that. I'm not interested in it, but I get it. I'm less aware of, of biographies of current people who are still alive who can still comment on their own lives. Now, admittedly, this guy who's called Mokhtar, the coffee guy, you're not going to have heard of him unless you happened into his story as it was happening. Um, so, he, you know, he's not going to tell his own story. Dave Eggers tells it for him. But, you know, I, this book is completely pedestrian. You know, Eggers is someone who's very good with language, can come up with a good metaphor, is quite funny. None of that is present in here. It's absolutely straight-faced storytelling about this guy's biography. And therefore, quite an uninvolving, dull read. And as I say, I don't really understand biographies of people who are alive. I mean, we're not even talking celebrity biographies here, which I absolutely detest to the, to the nth degree, because, I, you know, the concept of celebrity is one that really annoys me as a sort of media creation and opiate to the masses and all that kind of stuff. To be fair... The guy portrayed in here is not such a person. He's an ordinary guy, he had a vision, and he had to go to extraordinary lengths to make that vision happen. But it's the story of an entrepreneur uh, without much entrepreneurial uh, skills, it has to be said. Um, but, yeah, as I say, this is why I personally don't read biographies. I'm, I'm just not interested in, in these stories. I'm not interested in celebrity, so I don't want to read celebrity biographies. I'm not interested in reading a biography of somebody who's still alive, if it's their self-proper propaganda or, um, what's the word, um, hagiography. And as I say, to be fair to this guy, that's not in play. But it, all the same, it's still something I did not enjoy at all. I give it 2.5 stars. And that's really for the fact, uh, you know, it would have been two stars, but I gave it 2.5 because I was interested in how coffee was smuggled out by colonial powers. Okay.